I'm Jeff Seidman of Vassar College from the Love and Human Agency Project. I'm Benjamin Bagley, um, a postdoc at Vassar College, also affiliated with the Love and Human Agency Project. And we're interviewing Professor Elijah Milgram of the University of Utah. He's the author of three books and an anthology. He's the author of a book called Practical Induction. He's the author of a collection of essays uh, called Ethics Done Right and of a book called Hard Truths. And uh, Professor Milgram, I'd like to start by asking you, I understand uh, that you have a slogan you've been experimenting with. Could you tell us what it is? Um, yeah, so I do have a slogan. And um, um, there are two things that are the hardest things in philosophy. Um, the second hardest thing is not to anthropomorphize your fellow man. And the hardest thing in philosophy is not to anthropomorphize yourself. Could you explain what that means? Um, I'll explain a little bit of what it means. So um, there's a picture that ordinary people have, but and then there's a sort of analytic philosopher's version of this picture. Um, it's, it's very widely shared. Maybe the core of this picture is that people make decisions for reasons. And then there's a penumbra, right, that um, when they make decisions for reasons and they act on those decisions, um, there's a distinction between what they really do because they chose to do it and then stuff that just happens. And there are many other aspects of this picture of personhood. And maybe the core of the core of this picture is that um, 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 people have objectives and they, uh, they have views about how to attain those objectives and they uh, choose their actions on the basis of those views, right? Their beliefs about how to obtain objectives and the objectives rationalize, as the analytic philosophers used to say, the actions. Um, that's called reasoning instrumentally or uh, it's means and reasoning. Um, that's the picture and we project it onto the people around us and onto ourselves in something like the way that it used to be popular for um, animal psychologists to say that um, people project uh, uh, human uh, motivations and thoughts onto animals that uh, don't have them. So is this an error theory? You're saying that we ascribe to ourselves um, and to one another these means and reasoning um, and none of it is there? All, all these claims that we ascribe to one another are simply false? So let me give this a label and then I'll distinguish it from error theory. So call this nihilism about practical reasoning. Um, it looks like we do practical reasoning, thinking about what to do, and we don't. Um, now that's an extreme position and there's a sort of more moderate position that I'll, which is that mostly we don't. We do much, much less of it than we think. The interesting form of nihilism about practical rationality is itself practical, practical all the way down. The problem is that we're really, really bad at practical reasoning, at thinking about what to do. We might be so bad, although I'm not sure I'm in a position to defend this claim, we might be so bad that we don't even really know what it would be like to do it right. But anyway, we're bad enough so that the picture of people as mostly rational and making decisions on the basis of their, um, of their reasons that that's pretty much wrong. Then why does it appear that we're doing it? Why do we think that we're doing it um, uh, ourselves? Why do we think that others do, do it? Um, it feels like a ubiquitous uh, human activity, reasoning about means to our ends. You're really asking two questions, I think. Uh, so one question is, um, if we're so bad at it, why do we keep telling... So for almost anything you do, you can... I'll just stick with the means and stuff. For almost anything you do, you can generate a story about why it's a means to some objective. And in fact, um, people who now call themselves Enscomians think this is a characteristic of any action at all. If you do something, you can produce such a story. Um, so one question is why we produce the stories if we're not doing it. And then the other question, which I'm sure is implicit in what you were asking is, you know, if we're not actually figuring out how to achieve what we're what we think we want, how do we even get through life? Why doesn't everything just stop working? So every now and again, uh, 
somebody is really uncharitable to my cat. So my cat is really affectionate, and I'm told that that's just because I feed her. And what they're implying, they usually don't spell out all the steps, but what they're implying is that my cat is calculating. So my cat wants to be fed. She's figured out that in order to be fed, she has to be affectionate, and so she's affectionate. Now that um, exhibits a deep misunderstanding of how um, evolution solves problems. And I'm going to take the shortcut of um, personifying evolution or natural selection while I talk my way through it, but don't take that part seriously. Um, so, um, it's true that domestic house cats um, um, are affectionate because humans feed them, but the force of that because is that for a very, very, very many feline generations, um, house cats that got along better with people were better fed, better sheltered, and had a better, ch better chance of surviving and reproducing. And as a result of that history, house cats come equipped with um, dispositions that enable them to get along well with humans. Um, but that doesn't mean that evolution has turned over to the house cats the job of calculating um, the uh, means and sequence of, of actions that will get them fed. That's, again, from the would-be point of view of natural selection, that's just too hard and too fragile a solution. And so it, it doesn't happen that way. We're like cats. So, um, there are a great many things that we need to do, um, uh, and they're sequenced actions. One thing has to be done before the next thing can be done. Um, things that, if you like, natural selection needs us to do. People talk about reproduction and eating, but there's other things as well. And uh, if you think of this as a problem given to natural selection, there's, to, to evolution, there's two ways it can solve it. Um, one would be to equip us, to delegate to us, the task of figuring out the sequence and then executing it, which is pretty demanding. Um, the other way is to construct little sequences of activity that are triggered by something in your, in your environment or your surroundings, such that when you get to the end of this little jump, you find yourself normally, often enough, in circumstances that trigger the next jump. And if you look at human beings, uh, reproduction is pretty clearly managed this way, and eating also. So you think, why is, this, why is it so hard for people to diet? Um, well, because the decision whether or not to eat the brownie isn't tied to larger planning processes. By the time you notice that you're over your calorie quarter for the day, the brownie's just gone. Um, so that's, first of all, that's part of an answer to how it happens that um, uh, stuff can get done, right? Um, the, the stuff that, from the point of view of natural selection, is on a critical path is very unlikely to be handled deliberatively. Right? That's just too fragile, just like with the cats. Um, in fact, what will happen um, is um, human beings will produce activity that, from the point of view of analytic philosophers, isn't really full-fledged action. It's not the product of decisions. It's not autonomous in the technical sense that philosophers have. Um, um, it's not fully attributable, attributable to them. It flies under the radar. Um, and that's not the only explanation for how human life moves along, but for core activities, it's a large part of it. So now you might be thinking, so what are those bubamices for? Um, well, um, people do lots of things at once, they multitask. And um, those ongoing uh, streams of action have to be coordinated with each other. Now, philosophers often, the analytic philosophers, they have very crude ideas about how that happens, ideas that appeal to how strong your desires are or how urgent some activity is. But when you manage things that way, it works out badly, you end up with undergraduates pulling all-nighters the night before the paper is due. Um, actually, the way you have to manage it is streams of action come with what Elizabeth Anscombe would have called desirability characterizations. I mean things like this, 
when I brush my teeth in the morning, that's regular maintenance, and that's why I do it every morning. The, the characterization is a guide to how I fold it into my ongoing stream of activity. Education is preparation, and so I do it way ahead of time. I learn things I may not use for a decade. Um, there are things that uh, uh, require full focus, in my case, writing a philosophy paper, and there are things that should require full focus, for example, driving, and so you do only them. And then there are things that come with labels that tell you you can do other things while you do them. For example, having a conversation and lunch at the same time. Um, now, remember those under the radar actions that just get triggered. They're not triggered for a reason that's available to the agent, but the agent needs a characterization that will let him fold it into the rest of the things he's doing. So, some such characterization has to be generated. And when you look around, it's obvious that we have a piece of cognitive mechanism that does this. The psychologists call it um, cognitive dissonance reduction. You find yourself doing something, and you make up a little bobo misa um, that um, explains to you why you're, why you're doing it. Um, and the form, I think, I think this is insufficiently appreciated, the form these bobo mices take is very, very often um, a little means-end connection. I have an objective, and here's how I'm getting to my objective. Um, so that explains both um, why we produce these bobomyces, and it explains also um, um, a good part of uh, how we get through the day. So this workshop is in large part about love. That's something you've written about in the past, um, but in a way that doesn't sound at all like uh, the way you're talking now. Um, can you explain how this work fits in with your older work on love? So let me treat this as a, also as a two-part question. So um, from the point of view of the uh, uh, position I've just been sketching, of the ideas I've just been sketching, um, well, there's two things people might mean by love. Uh, there's what ordinary people mean by love, in, where the object of love is normally another person, or, or in Harlan, Harlan Ellison's case, um, I think he says a boy loves his dog. Um, and then there's this recently emerged technical philosopher's notion of love in which it mostly has to do with what you can't bring yourself to do, or what you can't imagine yourself doing. Um, but both the, now, from the point of view of the, of the, of the ideas I've been sketching, um, the second of those is just another layer of, um, on top of that picture of agency, of the anthropomorphizing picture of agency. Um, and if that picture is mostly not in place, there is no call for talk of love in this technical philosopher's sense. And um, um, the ordinary person's notion of love Talk of love will mostly appear, we can expect, as part of one of these retrospective bubomyces. You find yourself doing something, you need to rationalize it to yourself, and there's a concept conveniently at hand that will get invoked, but it doesn't explain what you do. Um, this sounds a little bit cynical, but remember the role of, remember that the... Nowadays, we use the word love often in the context of human reproduction, and remember that reproduction is, from evolution's point of view, on a critical path. We shouldn't expect that anything that gets invoked in our rationalizations has much to do with why we do things on that critical path. This oh, but I haven't talked about the, the, the connection between the older, yeah. uh, the, the older view. So, um, there's this peculiar thing that happens in philosophy. And actually, it kind of looks a bit like the thing I was talking about. Philosophy students find themselves working on one topic or another, and then they, they adopt it, right? They figure out a view, often in their dissertation, and that's their view for the rest of their life, just by accident. And they become identified with that position. And so it's always a puzzle if somebody has a view that deviates from what you think is his position, and actually people are expected to defend the same position lifelong. Other philosophers get disappointed if you have a new idea or you change your mind. <laughs> um, but actually, in my view, that's a terrible way to do philosophy. Um, 
you only really understand. So, so if you defend a position against all comers, and that's what you do, you don't understand other positions from the inside, and so you can't. You're not really defending it against all comers. You have to occupy different competing positions. Um, now, in the spectrum of positions that you could have about practical rationality, you could think of them as a spectrum that goes from the most minimal to the most maximal. Uh, maybe the second most minimal is the idea that it's all means end reasoning, just that. And in the past, I worked on richer views where there was means end reasoning and other things too. But the most minimal position is obviously that there's none at all. I've taken it upon myself in my, not just my spare time, to develop the minimal position too in a way that I find congenial, the, the practical all the way down version. So it's not that I have what had one view in the past, and now I've changed my mind and I have a different view. I'm developing these two views, and here's why you have to do this again. So Sylvia Brownrigg is a novelist, and I think a fairly well-known one right now. But she used to be a philosophy graduate student, and I had a conversation with her once uh, during that phase of her life, in which she explained what was wrong with the standard views of sincerity. So the standard views of sincerity in philosophy are more or less this. There's something you think, then there's something you say, and if what you say matches what you think, you are sincere. And she said, Look, how do I find out what I think? Suppose the question is whether P, some proposition, is true. Well, I argue for P as forcefully as I can. Right? And then I argue for not P as forcefully as I can. And then I find some other position that's maybe orthogonal to both of those, R, to argue for as forcefully as I can. And then, and when I argue for each of these things, it has to seem to me like I really believe it. And then I step back step back and I ask myself, then I'm in a position to ask myself, um, what's plausibly right? And then she said, following up, uh, none of this works unless I'm sincere throughout, and so sincerity has to precede what I believe, and so the standard account can't be right. And I woke up and I thought, oh, that's very cool, that sounds right to me. Um, so you have to develop all of these positions fully, sincerely, and believe them, although they're incompatible with each other, in order to have a decent chance of finding out what you think. Have you reached the step back moment yet between your earlier views and your later views where, other than sort of trying on a view, um, you, uh, you, you think one is more right than the other? I don't know that I've reached that point, but I think I can say this. So the point of arguing for an extreme view um, isn't always or necessarily to establish or for that matter refute that view. Um, that's a that's clumsy philosophy, um, and there's a long tradition of more deft philosophers um, arguing for or against extreme views as ways of develop, developing more nuanced positions. Um, here's just an example of the kind of thing I mean. Um, this is very early on. Aristotle argues for the principle of non-contradiction by considering an, op an opponent who is quite extreme. The opponent thinks that all contradictions are true. Now, if you're arguing for the principle of non-contradiction, the, the claim that no contradiction is ever true, it looks like you're, you have a straw man opponent, right? The, the moderate opponent, I don't know, but the Graham Priest's opponent, will think that some contradictions are true, but not all of them. But Aristotle is developing the argument against the extreme position as a way of exhibiting a problem that he thinks will stick in a more nuanced and more complicated way to the more moderate positions. And he's, but, but the arguing against the extreme position is the best way to exhibit it. In my own case, so suppose practical nihilism were true, what would you do? Well, nothing, because no decision you think you could make would count as a reasonable decision. Um, on the other hand, if practical nihilism is percentage-wise true, right, if it's quite often true, but sometimes we can think about what to do, um, then there's a live question of, of, uh, as to what to do about it. And I can think of various things. Um, so for example, um, we're very, very bad at figuring out the means to our ends. But in some very narrow domains, medicine, rocketry actually, um, the United States uh, space program in the 1950s or so, um, uh, uh, it seemed like they couldn't build a rocket that didn't blow up on launch. 
but then it became a national priority to put a man on the moon, um, and at the cost of I think two to three percent of the, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's the national budget or the GDP, an enormous amount of money at the time, um, people figure out how to actually take steps that not only seem to the people who were doing it as though they were aimed at the objective, but which actually achieved, achieved the objective. It was very resource intensive, but it worked. Um, what's characteristic of making it work is cognitive prostheses. So um, what dates to this period are things like PERT charts and Gantt charts, project management software. In medicine, you have things like um, the double-blind uh, randomized placebo-controlled studies. Um, so if practical nihilism is a good deal true, maybe the lesson is more cognitive prostheses. Um, maybe the cognitive prostheses can't be gotten to work or can't be gotten to solve the problem, then there's another approach. Um, normally when we think about practical rationality, we think, okay, let's figure out what the norms for doing it right are, and then let's figure out ways to get people to conform to the norms. So I guess logicians are assigned the first task, and critical thinking classes are assigned the second task. Um, but you might think it's just not going to work out. Right? Maybe that will be the upshot, in which case we should be looking for ways not to succeed at being practically rational, but um, ways of making failure pay. And this is a very different approach um, uh, than I think uh, we've been taking. We scarcely know how to think about it. Going back to the rocket science case, mm -hmm. that seems seems implausible that our you know our evolution that evolutionary pressures uh, made us good rocket science rocket scientists in any direct way. I mean, equipped us with what it takes to uh, to design rockets. So even if the nihilist story you want to tell is right about our decisions about whom to marry and um, whether to have kids and all sorts of other things that evolution has an interest in. Uh, but it seems that could be true and it might still be false. It still might be the case that when it comes to rocket science, evolution has left us unequipped and we are practical reasoners in a, uh, in a richer sense than nihilism allows. Okay, so let me, I need to go back a step and motivate the nihilism. I won't really give an argument for it, but I'll motivate it, and motivating it will allow me to say how we should think about cases like the rocket science. I'll do it in two ways. So, um, for all of recorded human history, as far as I can tell, um, people have understood that there's a connection between um, sex and childbirth. Often they've had peculiar ideas about what this connection, how it worked. Um, um, we were talking about Aristotle a few moments ago, and he has peculiar ideas about that, but they knew about the connection. Um, and also, for all of human history up to, I think, about the beginning of the 20th century, childbirth is quite dangerous for the mother. Um, two to three percent death rates were just par for the course, and in the in, in some environments, I, for example, Zemmelweis's uh, maternity ward, uh, you got death rates of well over 20%. So consider now a pair of practical syllogisms. I'm still speaking Arist Aristoteles. Um, one for the girls and one for the boys. So here's the practical syllogism for the girls. Um, sex is really dangerous. If I do it, I could die. I don't want to die. I won't have sex. And here's the boys. Sex is really dangerous. If I do it, I could kill the person I'm having sex with. I don't want to kill her. I won't have sex. For all of human history, so Aristotle says that the conclusion of um, a practical syllogism properly understood is an action, and he's right. Um, for all of human history, anyone able to execute a practical syllogism, one of these practical syllogisms, all the way to the end, was systematically weeded out of the gene pool. Now, think of this as a problem posed to natural selection. Um, now, natural selection often solves problems like these in many ways at once. Um, um, 
and we're not sure how it's done, but we can, uh, ex we can anticipate some solutions. The one philosophers are most likely to uh, notice in their current mood is people who want to have sex so much they more than they want to live, or men who don't care if the woman they're having sex with lives or dies, but there are many others. For example, um, there could be a subject-specific inferential blindness, but there could also be um, the ability to draw the conclusion intellectually, but then to fail to act on it. Philosophers treat this as a puzzle. They call it acrosia, or weakness of will, and they find it mysterious. But in the evolutionary context, it's clear why it's there. Um, um, there could be um, a tendency, tendency to neglect small probabilities, which is why people don't buckle their seatbelts unless you penalize them. Um, and there could also be other solutions. For example, um, women might simply not be given the choice as to whether to have sex or not. Against this background, this isn't an argument, but it's warm-up. Against this background, it would be surprising if human beings were able to execute practical syllogisms, this very simple inference pattern, robustly, reliably, and correctly across the board. Um, so now, what that means is, now of course, natural selection, still personifying it, natural selection cares that we get our practical syllogisms right sometimes. So, um, what the, this, story motiv about the, uh, this story motivates is an investigation of how good or bad we are at practical reasoning and what the contours of that are. And let me, now I can't do the investigation for you here, right? Le, but let me describe what such an investigation could look like and also anticipate the sort of conclusion you might, upshot you might get. So you look at a domain where you really can check, we're just focusing on means and reasoning now because it is the core and it's fairly you know, narrow and, and uh, controllable. Um, where you really can check if the means-end reasoning is done right, and you can compare it to how people are inclined to do the means-end reasoning. Um, um, and we have such a domain. I was talking about rocket science a moment ago, but I am going to shift to medicine. So nowadays, the rule is that um, if you want to introduce a new drug, you have to show that it's safe and effective, and what it takes to show that it's safe and effective is one or more um, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. Right? And otherwise, you don't get to do it. Um, and it turns out that when you check in this way, when you look back at pre-modern medicine, um, at, at the at the history of disastrously awful therapies, of deadly surgeries and bleeding and cauteries and mustard poultices and um, um, the moment somebody checked, just by counting how many people lived and died, it became obvious in retrospect that none of that, that all of that was just made up. It wasn't just that people were wrong about the facts. It was a, a tendency philosopher. Philosophers will talk about means end reasoning this way. They'll say, okay, your means end rational of given your beliefs about how to get what you want and given your objectives, you do the thing that the point. But here, it's obvious in retrospect that people simply never cared whether their factual beliefs about what's a means to what, whether they were any good. They simply didn't bother for 2,000 years, even on a subject where both doctors and patients sincerely, deeply cared about achieving their ends. This is remarkable. Right? And if you simply don't care whether your beliefs about how to attain your ends are any good, you're not instrumentally rational. Now, in the one domain where we can really check, it turns out that people simply don't care to be instrumentally rational we can anticipate this. If we figure out how to check in other domains, we might find the same result. In fact, we might find it in many such domains. But we've changed in the, our practice of medicine. Um, precisely, I take it, because we have found a means of checking. Um, we now don't do mustard poultices and bleedings and uh, do do much more effective uh, treatments. What explains that switch? 
Um, if not that, evidently we did care, and we recognized that the means we were taking were not bringing us anywhere near to, uh, to the ends that we cared about. It's a difficult question how the transition to relying on cognitive, I described this as a cognitive prosthesis earlier, how relying on the cognitive prosthesis was managed. Remember, Zemmelweis ended up in an insane asylum, and I think he only lived, I think he was beaten to death by the guards if I remember the history right. Um, so people did not take well to the idea that you have to check the effectiveness of your, of your means. And even today, even in medicine, this is very, very weak. I'll, I'll give you just one example from the past few years. So one way of handling um, back pain uh, fairly recently um, is injecting medical cement into the bone. Intuitively, you can kind of see why this would work. Right? There's an intuitive story to be told about why this makes sense. Um, but for a long time, there was never any good study that showed that it did work. And finally, independently, two groups produced the high-quality studies that showed it to be no better than placebo. Um, the uh, surgery is still practiced. Um, surgeons won't give it up. I mean, some do, but mostly that many don't. Um, and I was told by one spine surgeon that he had been at a spine conference where um, physicians in the audience got up rather in the manner of um, people in church bearing their testimony to say that they knew from their own experience that um, this treatment relieved patients' pain. So even the training that people get in medical school, which tells you not to be a victim of this cognitive illusion, even in our best case, where we have the procedures and we have the training, it's still, it, the, 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 the fix is taken only very weakly. Let's go back to love. So you said earlier that the idea that love is a, that there's this mental attitude of love and that it explains some of what we do is a bubamiza like the bubamiza that we are instrumental reasoners. Uh, could you say more about that? So remember there are um, two things you might mean by, by love. There's this new technical philosopher's notion and there's what ordinary people mean. Um, the technical philosopher's notion looks a little bit like this. Um, there are things that you think that you um, just can't not do, or conversely, things that you think that you just have to do. And um, the notion of love has been introduced to kind of give conceptual machinery for describing that. And so you would say of somebody, he loves his daughter, um, he, would just, he would just never walk away from her, he can't do that. But, um, if the trigger situation arises, no matter what people say about themselves, they just will do that. Right? It's irrelevant what they think about themselves. Um, later on, when they find themselves in a position, they, they do something that's triggered in some other way, where a natural retroactive rationalization is to, is to say, I'm doing it because I love so-and-so, they will ascribe to themselves the love, and thereby they will have it. But it doesn't explain their actions and it doesn't predict their actions. That's it does help manage coordination. So, you've made, on the one hand, you've made an empirical claim. When the trigger situation comes, the person won't act in the way that supposedly love should make him or her act. What are you basing that on? So, as in all of these uh, uh, anticipations, um, so what I gave was two warm-up stories. Um, and I gave, a, uh, I gave a, a description of my cat and an explanation of my cat. Um, I think we really haven't started to investigate this, and so I don't want to insist that I know what the empirical investigation will show. Um, but I think we need to be prepared for the idea that it will show that we aren't the anthropomorphized people that we think we are. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I wonder if we could return briefly to the other kind of love, not the philosopher's notion of love, but love, the notion of love that figures in everyday people's talk about themselves and one another, and also in literature and in 
art and in pop songs. Um, do you think this too is a bubu maisa for something entirely different? Um, when there's something entirely different going on, or is there uh, is there more credibility in the non-philosophical everyday notion of love as a way of actually explaining what people do um, than in the philosopher's version? Let me say three things that I'm not sure are entirely consistent with each other. Um, so, on the one hand, if um, it's a mistake to anthropomorphize human beings. It's very hard to see that there's a place for the ordinary talk of love. It figures in the world of reasons, right? You ask people why they fell in love. You ask what reasons love gives them. It's all about, it's too woven into this picture of people who, to, the, to the, this picture that I'm thinking doesn't make any sense. It is, is deeply false to what kind of creatures we are. Um, there's a second thought. So this is acknowledging something I think Aristotle got right. So think about the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, his, one of the, the, the all-time great works in moral philosophy. It's got ten books, but nobody knows what to do with the tenth book. It's a perennial puzzle for people who work in the history of ancient philosophy to say how that tenth book got there and what it's supposed to be doing. So let's just lop it off. If you lop it off, the tail end of the Nicomachean Ethics, books 8 and 9, are devoted to a particular kind of love, friendship, companionate love. And I think it's the longest treatment of anything in the Ethics. I may be wrong about that, but anyway, it's one of the longest. Um, so Aristotle thought that if you're writing your way through Ethics, um, you need a treatment of love, a lengthy treatment of love, and what's more, it's the last thing, so it's the climax. It's the capstone. It's what holds everything else together. Now, I don't exactly buy Aristotle's ethics, um, but it does seem to me like he, he was getting something right when he organized his book that way, or his lecture course that became the book. Um, that said, so that's a reason to take the topic very seriously. The, the, the topic of um, love as ordinary people mean the word, um, to take it very seriously as a philosopher. But having said that, I had a colleague in a former job um, who uh, uh, um, helped me understand the social life of the new place I had moved to. So. I had just moved to a, a city in the south, and um, people interacted with me way too much. I mean, when, at the checkout counter, people would sort of talk to you and uh, banter, and when you went to the bank, you had to have little conversations, and it was very nervous-making to me. I formerly lived on the East Coast, right? And he explained to me that um, in New York, the rule is, that if you're walking down the street and somebody looks at you and smiles, you run. Whereas in Nashville, um, if you're walking down the street and somebody doesn't look at you and smile, you run. Although I think the topic has to be taken seriously, I've learned this. Um, when somebody uses the word love in the ordinary sense, wh whether it's a philosopher or an ordinary person, normally the right reaction is to run. Maybe we should end on that note. Yeah. Professor Milgram, thank you for talking with us. Thank you.